as we prepare to explore spectroscopy, let us consider a first very simple spectroscopy experiment. So we're going to enter the lab and we're going to perform some spectroscopic measurements and we are going to attempt to determine the structure of an unknown molecule. Now, before we get too far, I want to encourage you to review Lewis structure. Lewis structure is not just some stick drawing. It is actually a code for the electronic structure of a molecule. Let's consider formaldehyde. It is a very simple empirical formula. CH2O, the simplest carbohydrate. But what is the structure of CH2O? Well, there's all kinds of ways to arrange those molecules, those atoms, I mean. You can have a linear arrangement, you could have a triangular arrangement, you could probably make a square out of it, you could do all kinds of things. But you know what? There's really only one that makes sense electronically. If you follow the rules of Lewis structure, you will quickly realize there's really only sort of one reasonable structure that you could create for formaldehyde. What are the rules? Well, you learned the rules in your first year chemistry course. You learn them again when you took organic chemistry last year. So you have mastered Lewis structure by now. But if you've forgotten, you need to review. You need to master Lewis structure. So take a moment and review the rules of determining Lewis structures, how to determine formal charges on atoms, how to identify the valency of atoms, to evaluate whether or not the molecule is reasonable. You need to master that right now, early in this course, before we get much farther. Look at these two possible structures for formaldehyde. Here's the correct structure for formaldehyde. And we see these lines here, which represents pairs of electrons in a molecular orbital that best describes this sigma bond here. And here's a pair of electrons in a molecular orbital that best describes this sigma bond here. And here is a sigma bond and a pi bond, two pairs of electrons. And here's some lone pairs in orbitals that best describe a lone pair here. And so the Lewis structure actually describes the electronic structure of this molecule. Here's an alternate, more linear structure for formaldehyde. Doesn't look too crazy, but there are some problems. Here, this carbon atom right here has 1, 2 in this sigma bond, 3, 4 in this sigma bond, 5, 6 in this lone pair, 6 electrons. That is a deficient octet. So even though all of these atoms are neutral, we have here a deficient octet. This is actually a carbene structure. That would be a highly reactive molecule. So it's not something you'd find in a bottle. So if you've got some formaldehyde in a bottle, you wouldn't be proposing this structure. This might be a high energy intermediate in some other reaction, but it's not something you're gonna isolate. Now, you could propose an alternate electronic structure where we take this lone pair and put it into a pi system and make a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And if you did that, you would satisfy the valence rule for carbon. You would have the double bond here, that's four electrons, five, six, seven, eight, everything would be happy, except this carbon would actually be negatively charged when you examine its formal charge. This oxygen would be positively charged when you examine its formal charge. And so we've got a split charge elid there. And that's something else you try to avoid with Lewis structures. So no matter how you crack it, this particular arrangement is going to have a problem uh, with one of the Lewis structure rules didn't satisfy valence, that's very bad. Split charges, that's also fairly bad. Here is a better structure where there's no split charges, all valences are satisfied, nothing crazy going on. If I had to choose between these two, I'd choose this one. So review Lewis structure. And so once you've sort of established for a particular empirical formula, a set of reasonable Lewis structures, you just have to examine spectroscopy uh, measurements and see if you uh, can eliminate some of those reasonable structures and then what's left after you've eliminated uh, structures that don't fit your data is probably the right answer. So let's consider a very simple spectroscopic experiment. Imagine you've been given a molecule or a sample. The first thing you're going to need is to determine the molecular weight and the empirical formula or at least a proposed empirical formula for that molecule. There's lots of ways to establish a molecular weight. Freezing point depression is a classic way where you might mix it up with some camphor and measure the freezing point depression. That'll tell you how many moles of material you have. Of course, you've weighed it, so you know the mass. Now you know the mass per mole. 
Um, so that's a sort of a classic old school way of determining the molecular formula. However, today we would use mass spectrometry. So we'll use mass spectrometry that will give us hopefully the molecular ion and the exact mass of the molecule. Elemental analysis can tell us the percent mass of various elements and it's very useful for uh, determining how much nitrogen or uh, sulfur or hydrogen or carbons in a molecule uh, and it can help confirm a uh, empirical formula that we might propose from the molecular uh, mass. Once we've got the mass and a proposed empirical formula uh, we can use infrared spectrometry to basically identify any functional groups of the molecule. Once we've got functional groups that are infrared active identified, we'd move on to nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry, which is going to tell us the different environments in which protons and carbon nuclei exist in the molecule. So if we see three signals in proton NMR, there are three different environments for protons. If we see five signals in carbon NMR, there are five different environments for carbon. So that means there's five carbons, or you have a symmetrical molecule where some of the carbons are the same, and there's five different kinds of carbons. And so at the very least, we'll be able to tell from our nuclear magnetic resonance spectra how many different kinds of proton and carbon centers there are in the molecule. And of course, NMR is a very powerful technique, and it'll give us incredibly useful information about the connectivity and the uh, adjacent relationships of all of these atoms, and we'll see that much later on in this course. So right now, though, we're just going to focus on we're going to get the mass, we're going to know a functional group or two, and we're going to know how many different kinds of protons and how many different kinds of carbons. Just from that alone, I swear to you, you will be able to solve half the structures you see in this course. So the key to that, though, is being able to propose reasonable Lewis structures and having an instinct for writing out molecular formulas based on empirical formulas. And then you'll be able to take the information you have on functional groups and the information you have on the different kinds of protons and carbons and scratch off a whole number of structures off that list you just made. And then if you've got, say, five structures left that fit your model, you can then look at the details of the various spectra and narrow it right down to the final correct answer. So let's do the first experiment. Let's run it through our mass spectrometer. So we injected it into a GC and fed it straight on into our GC mass spec, or we can uh, put it straight through into an EI instrument. There's all kinds of ways to get a mass spec. And we determined that the mass was 106 atomic mass units. Um, we saw two major peaks, though. We saw the molecular ion at 106 atomic mass units. And we saw the biggest peak, though, was at 91 atomic mass units, which is a loss of 15 atomic mass units. What weighs 15? A methyl group. I bet, you know, I can't tell for sure, but I bet this molecule has a methyl group in it that's capable of being blown off in the uh, mass spec. And so whatever structure I propose, I'm going to make sure that there's a methyl group, a terminal methyl group on an alkane chain, a methyl group hanging off of a phenyl ring, a methyl group off of a carbonyl. There's going to be a methyl group coming off here somewhere, so uh, I'm pretty certain of that, looking at that structure, or that spectra. So what, uh, what empirical formula should I be proposing here? Well, let's have a look here. This formula, C8H10, fits our mass. If there was an oxygen present, the formula that fits the mass best now is C7H8O, and, and on and on. We got this from the rule of 13. Read about the rule of 13, learn about the rule of 13. The rule of 13 is a great way to start proposing some initial empirical formulas. So um, uh, that's another thing you need to do, uh, is sort of get tuned up on the rule of 13 there. So now that we've proposed C8H10 as our empirical formula, we can start confirming that with IR. Well, here we have an infrared spectrum. Let's look at it pretty quickly. We have this region here, which corresponds to carbon-hydrogen stretching vibrations. And it's pretty characteristic. Most, if there's alkanes in your molecule, and most carbon molecules are going to have an alkane region, you will see stretching around 2,900 wave numbers. And so basically, on this line that I drew here, on the right-hand side of that line, below 3,000 wave numbers, that's where you'll see alkane C8 stretches. If you have any signals above 3,000, 
you would strongly suspect alkene CH stretches. So there, I see some signals above 3,000. If I see those, I smell alkene. And if you see a, a signal way out here, around 3,300 or 3,400, uh, you're definitely guaranteed to be seeing an alkyne CH stretch. But here, I see an alkene. And there's lots of other information you can get here. This tells me exactly what's going on with this molecule. As a matter of fact, this little telltale region here, this uh, bending vibration here, um, pretty much tells me exactly the structure of this molecule. I could tell you what's going on here right from this IR. And we'll get into those details later on in the course. I'm only going to tell you about this now. All I'm going to say right now is what this IR told me is that there's alkenes in this molecule. We're keeping it simple. So, I conclude that there's alkanes and there's alkenes in this molecule. All right, well, let's go on to the NMR. So I've done a proton NMR and a carbon-13 NMR. The proton NMR shows me two separate signals. And the integration of those signals is a 2 to 3 ratio. That tells me that there's two protons in one signal or three protons in the other. Or that there's four protons in one signal and six protons in the other. You know what? My empirical formula I proposed, what is it? C8H10? That's 4 and 6. That adds up to 10. So I bet that there's 4 protons in one signal, 4 protons in this signal, and 6 protons in this signal. So I know that there's two separate environments for protons. Now there's 10 protons. This must be a highly symmetrical molecule because there's only two environments. So I already have an idea. It's a symmetrical molecule. There's only two environments for protons, two kinds of protons. That's a great piece of information to have. The carbon-13 NMR shows me that there are three different signals for carbon. Now there's eight carbons there, I theorize, but there's only three different kinds of carbon. Again, a highly symmetrical molecule, only three different kinds of carbon. Well, that's what this NMR is telling me. I'm keeping it pretty simple. I've chosen something with very simple NMR signals for you to consider. And really, this information is telling us that there's two kinds of protons, there's three kinds of carbons. Now, the actual position of these peaks is very characteristic of the kind of protons they are. And the actual, especially in the carbon-13 system, the, the position of the peaks is especially very clear as to exactly what kind of carbon you're talking about. And when we come to understand nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry, you will not only be able to tell how many different kinds of environments you see for each kind of nuclei, you'll be able to pretty much tell exactly which functional group you're dealing with. Um, as a matter of fact, IR spectroscopy is almost completely unnecessary if you've got good NMR spectra for your compounds. The difference is an IR spectrometer costs $40,000 and a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer costs half a million. So uh, what's more likely to be on your bench? <laughs> so IR is still very useful. People use IR all the time because it's available, it's easy, um, and uh, you'll need a small, small amount of material. NMR, especially carbon-13 NMR, you need a lot more material. Um, and, of course, you have a much more expensive instrument, and probably you're paying a salary for the person who actually runs that instrument and keeps it alive. So, uh, however, it's worth the money. Nuclear magnetic resonance, as we will discover in this course, uh, will solve almost all your problems in structural elucidation. Get to know your NMR spectrometer or spectroscopist in your chemistry department. Uh, buy him or her a beer. Uh, they're going to be a very useful person in your life. All right, let's make a fact list. And this is what I highly recommend you do, no matter what you're doing. Make a list of facts that you get from your spectra, and then throw away the spectra and use those facts to propose your final structure. And then when you propose that structure, go back to the spectra and look for the fine details in the spectra or further details in the spectra that will confirm your hypothesis. But stick with the facts. Let's just do the facts first. The fact. The fact is, what, what's, what's one fact here? One fact is, we've determined that the empirical formula is C8H10. And we got that from the fact that there was no oxygen in the elemental analysis, there was no nitrogen in the elemental analysis. Uh, C8H10 fit the elemental analysis and the molecular mass that we got from mass spectrometry. That means there's four degrees of unsaturation, which means basically there's uh, four double bonds or three double bonds and a ring. Um, 
Uh, you, will be unfam you will be familiar with the degrees of unsaturation from last year's organic chemistry. Um, it's right there in the first chapter in our chemistry, in our spectroscopy textbook. Come to understand what degrees of unsaturation mean. Four degrees of unsaturation. What has four degrees of unsaturation? A phenyl group has four degrees of unsaturation. Whenever I see a molecule in an introductory spectroscopy course that has four, five, or six degrees of unsaturation, I immediately draw a phenyl ring. Now, that might not be correct, but you know what? If I see four, five, or degree, six, seven, eight, nine, ten degrees of unsaturation, I immediately draw a phenyl ring. And then I sort of go off of that until I'm convinced that there's no way it could be there. Uh, and you know what? 95% of the time, if you have four degrees or more of unsaturation, there's a phenyl ring. So think about it. This is a simple, basic introductory course. You're not going to see any kind of a molecule that's huge or crazy. So if there's four or five or six degrees of unsaturation, draw a phenyl ring and then proceed from there. I'm not saying that's the way it'll be. I guarantee you I'll trick you once, but most of the time it'll be a phenyl ring. Now, uh, the IR showed us that there was alkenes present, and of course there was the usual alkanes present as well. NMR showed us that there were two kinds of protons, and the integration showed that there was four of one kind and six of the other. That's going to be really useful. And there was three kinds of carbon atoms, so we know it's a highly symmetrical molecule. Um, so that's the information that we got. That's our fact list. And what do we do with those facts? Now we have a puzzle. We've got a few simple facts to solve. And now we can go and we can solve this spectroscopic mystery using those facts. So throw away the spectra. Let's just do those facts. There's two kinds of protons. There's three kinds of carbons. There's alkenes. Go! Well, using the rules of Lewis structure, you can propose all kinds of reasonable Lewis structures for the empirical formula. This is a small list of possible structures. Now, this list includes alkenes because I know there's alkenes, so that really helped you know, prevent me from having to draw 500 structures, right? So, so alkenes. And this list is not exhaustive uh, in these classes of molecules either. Um, you can move double bonds around, but for the most part, this is a pretty good list, I think, to start with to just sort of consider what our structures might be. There's four degrees of unsaturation. Well, if you've got eight carbons, the simplest thing you could draw right off the bat would be this octene here. Look at that, four double bonds. Um, that satisfies all our degrees of unsaturation. Of course, it's all alkenes. There's no alkenes there. I wonder if we really would have much of a CH stretch in the alkane region with this. Um, also, how many different kinds of protons are there? Well, let's see. There's one, and there's two, because this is cis to this proton. This is trans to this proton. These two protons are different. So there's one kind of proton. There's another kind of proton. Three, that's a different kind of proton. Four, five. Now, these two protons are the same. Why are they the same? Because right here, right this, there's a the center of symmetry in the molecule. If I put a little axis down through that bond and I rotated this molecule 180 degrees, I wouldn't know I had done it. This proton and this proton are exactly the same. This proton and this proton are exactly the same. The far ends of this molecule, this end and this end, are exactly the same. So there's only five different kinds of protons here. Look at this molecule, draw it out, convince yourself of that. There's four different kinds of carbons. The two ends, the two carbons that are one from the end, the two carbons that are two from the end, and the two carbons that are three from the end. They're next to each other. There's only four kinds of carbons. But you know what? That doesn't fit our model, does it? That doesn't fit the data. Two kinds of protons, three kinds of carbons, not this one. Here's a crazy one. A couple of three-membered rings. We know that uh, that's, that's uh, something you don't see every day. Um, and then these bunch of double bonds. I, I kept and the spirit of symmetry, because we know the molecule is symmetrical, I kept this molecule as symmetrical as possible. There's other places you could put the double bonds. Um, and, and as long as you mirror it over here, you'd also have a symmetrical situation. But no matter what you do, you can't get to that two kinds of protons, three kinds of carbon. So eh, that's not fitting. I tried four-membered rings. And that leaves you with a lot of spare carbons, which you can decorate around and stuff. But what happens is these first two proposed structures with asymmetrical substitution, they then all the carbons are different. Eight different carbons, that doesn't fit our model. But here's something. Ooh, that looks good. Look at this. 
there's a mirror plane right through the middle of this. Plane of rotation. So uh, this actually only has two kinds of protons. Look at this. One, two. These are identical. There's a mirror plane right through here. If I reflected this, if I reflected this molecule, or if I put an axis of rotation here and rotated it 180 degrees, that carbon and that carbon, exactly the same. You wouldn't know that I had flipped that molecule over 180 degrees. So this carbon and this carbon are exactly the same, and the protons on them are exactly the same in a 2 to 3 ratio. There's four of these, there's six of these. That fits the proton NMR's idea perfectly. However, there's four kinds of carbons. There's that one, that one, that one, that one. There's this half of the molecule, this side of the molecule is the same as that side of the molecule. There's eight carbons. Divide that in half for each half of the molecule. There's four kinds of carbons here. So that, no, looked good. Looked good in the proton idea, but not in the carbon-13 idea. So didn't really work out. Well, we can include a five-membered ring in there. And remember, a ring is one degree of unsaturation, so it really helps us to not have to squeeze in four double bonds. Um, this is a symmetrical molecule. Unfortunately, it's got three kinds of protons, so that didn't work. That one's not symmetrical. That one doesn't work. Here's another symmetrical version. Again, three kinds of protons, five kinds of carbons, not working out for us. All right, so here we go. So here's six-membered ring. There's your classic phenyl ring. Remember I said? You see four degrees of unsaturation, draw a phenyl ring. You see five degrees of unsaturation, draw a phenyl ring and put another double bond in somewhere. Um, so never ever forget that. Four degrees of unsaturation, draw a phenyl ring, carry on from there. It might be right. Well, let's see. There's my phenyl ring and I've got two carbons left over. And so I decorated this with two methyl groups. Remember I said there was a methyl group. You could see it in the mass spec. One of these get chopped off. 15 gone. So if I break that bond and it departs in the mass spec, uh, that kind of fits that idea. Unfortunately, this one's got four carbons because there's like two halves to this molecule, right? I could split it right here. One, two, three, four carbons. Doesn't fit our requirement for three kinds of carbons. Also, there's three kinds of protons too. Well, let's look at this one. So there I've just spaced the methyl groups one away. And again, that molecule's got a mirror plane right down the middle of it. But again, four kinds of protons. And this one's got five kinds of carbons because that carbon and that carbon are different. So there's one, two, three, four, five carbons in this molecule, five different kinds of carbons in this molecule. All right, let's look at this one. This one's got a mirror plane that passes through the methyl groups. That means, and also you get a mirror plane that passes through here. So the top of this molecule, the tops of this molecule and the bottom are the same. The sides are the same. This molecule is even more degrees of symmetry. And remember, we've got eight carbons, but we only see three kinds. We've got 10 protons, but we only see two kinds. So we're looking for a molecule that's really symmetrical. This one seems to fit that bill. It's symmetrical all kinds of ways. So let's count this out here. I've got four protons. And you know what? These are all exactly the same. This proton and this proton and this proton and this proton are exactly the same because I could run an axis down here and flip that 180 degrees and these two protons would exchange. I can flip an axis this way and rotate that molecule 180 degrees and these two protons are the same. This proton is the same as this proton. This proton is the same as this proton. They're all the same. These four protons are the same. So there's four protons that will give me a single signal. And here's two methyl groups and they're the same because again, if I rotate that molecule 180 degrees, they look exactly the same. So, so this seems to fit the bill with the proton NMR. Got alkenes, we've got methyl groups that we saw in the mass spec, and we have six of one kind of signal and four of another kind of a signal. Now, what about the carbons? Okay, those are the same. That's one signal. These two carbons are the same. That's another signal. And these four carbons, that one, that one, and that one, and that one, are the same. And so there's only three signals for, for carbon in this molecule. So it fits the carbon 13 NMR, it fits the proton NMR. All right, there's one, one for the list. Put that on the list. All right, now there's some seven-membered rings. Um, nothing seems to work. They either have eight different kinds of carbons, and even this one, which has some symmetry, it's five different kinds of carbons, five different kinds of protons, not working for you. Um, now, here we have a octatriene. Um, 
Let's look at, take a look at this. Nice and symmetrical down through the middle here, but only one degree of symmetry. So you can't really turn eight carbons into three because you only got one degree of symmetry. There's four kinds of carbons because there's a degree of symmetry that splits the molecule in half. There's four kinds of protons. It doesn't fit our model. So what fits our model? That fits our model. Paraxylene fits the data. Is it the right structure? Well, we can look at the details of the NMR and, carb and proton and carbon-13 and the IR, and we will actually see, we will see those, uh, that bending band um, in, uh, in the IR spectrum tells me that it's para-substituted. The characteristic frequencies there around 1750 tell me that it's para-substituted phenyl ring. The IR actually told me all about this. The NMR, the frequencies that we see for the proton NMR, I can see uh, at seven parts per million in the proton NMR, characteristic of aromatic carbon hydrogen, well basically uh, hydrogens on an aromatic carbon. And that the, the, the methyl group uh, also was easily seen in the proton NMR. Um, the free, the uh, chemical shifts or the part per million for the carbon 13 NMR also tell you exactly what's going on. So once you've decided that this is my candidate, I can go to the NMR, I can go to the proton NMR and I can confirm by the chemical shifts uh, or the numbers that you're seeing for those peaks you can confirm that this is indeed the structure of the carbon-13. You can actually calculate what the carbon-13 chemical shifts should be and model that against your data, and you will see that they fit very closely, and therefore this is likely the correct structure. And of course, since we have a parasubstituted phenyl ring, we have some very characteristic patterns to look for in the IR, and we will see those in the IR now that we have kind of zeroed in on this as the final structure. So use the most simple basic ideas of our three major spectroscopic techniques to help carve away all of the many possible Lewis structures that you might propose for an empirical formula. And then, if you've got a handful of structures left that seem to fit this simple interpretation, numbers of different kinds of hydrogens, numbers of different kinds of carbons, the functional group list you get from IR, once you've got uh, in a larger molecule, you might have a handful of possibilities. Then you go to the details, and you can very quickly knock the final few off that list and leave you with the one that is the answer. What's the key? An understanding of Lewis structure. I know it's, oh, it's, it's, it's high school, I know. You think you never have to use Lewis structure again. But the key to Lewis structure is that you will be able to draw reasonable structures from an empirical formula. And then, using the spectroscopic results, you will be able to scratch off everything that doesn't fit the data and then you will take the very small list that's left and you will look at the details of the spectra and that's what we're going to be learning about throughout this course how to use those details how to use the exact chemical shifts in carbon 13 nmr and the approximate chemical shifts in proton nmr to determine what kind of uh, groups they are to use connectivity information which will be revealed to you in um, the peaks being split in proton NMR. Those were nice singlets we saw there, and you'll see in paraxylene, no protons were adjacent to each other. Those protons were on carbons where the adjacent carbon had no protons. So I, I chose that so that there would just be nice, sharp, single peaks for you in the proton NMR. But you know what? When things get more complicated and you see splitting, that's a good thing. That's a great thing that tells you exactly what's next to what. And of course, at the end of this course, we will talk about two-dimensional NMR, which will tell you exactly which protons are next to which protons, and which protons are on which carbons, and which protons are on a carbon that's adjacent to another carbon. And actually, you can run that two or three carbons along the backbone. So with various two-dimensional NMR techniques, you will be able to determine the exact connectivity network within a molecule. Um, and and you wonder why I taught you IR spectroscopy at all. Uh, but you'll still have to know it for the final exam. So um, the emphasis in this course will be on NMR, because as an organic chemist, it is the go-to most useful instrument on planet Earth. Um, IR spectroscopy is important as well. Why? Because it's on your bench. And if you're doing functional group transformations and you just want to make sure the reaction is complete, IR is the way to go. Mass spec. Uh, well, a lot of people will tell you mass spec is all you'll ever need once you've got the exact mass of that molecule and the fragmentation pattern. Um, and uh, subsequent fragmentations of fragments that come off that molecule in mass spec, mass spec techniques. Um, 
uh, they'll tell you that's all you need. And you know what? They're right. Mass spec is a very powerful technique, but mass spec instruments, or at least mass spec instruments that can do ion trap methods and more sophisticated fragmentation experiments are even more expensive than that NMR I was talking about. And they definitely need a guy who knows what he's doing. So uh, you're paying another salary there as well. But if you're in a large institution and you've got a mass spec department or a mass spec uh, uh, facility and an NMR facility and experts in there, to uh, help you out, you'll be able to elucidate the structure of just about any molecule you come across. And we're just going to be touching the surface of that in this course. And I hope you'll come along with me in the ride. I hope that you will master how to propose Lewis structures based on an empirical formula. I hope that you will come along with me and investigate how mass spec can be used to determine more than just the molecular mass of the molecule. How IR can tell you uh, not just functional groups, but also some structural information, and then, of course, lots and lots of NMR. So I hope you enjoyed this course, and I hope you enjoyed your first simple spectroscopy experiment. And we're going to be doing a lot of these kinds of exercises in this course, combining different spectroscopic techniques to determine the final proposed structure. And you know what? You just might be right. <laughs>